Um, I'm uh, I'm actually uh, happy to uh, welcome the uh, and start uh, uh, the the panel on uh, let's say discussion of what we have been seeing today and also a little bit about uh, what we are planning. Uh, what what are the I mean interesting uh, discussion points uh, uh, around uh, around the the topic and uh, let me uh, just say that this ah oh, Kate is actually back wonderful. So, <laughs> so good to have you back. Yeah, okay. Sorry, my, my battery died. <laughs> it's okay. It's okay. Good. Um, so uh, let me uh, uh, let's say let me just uh, uh, tell that my role is uh, is simply to uh, I mean be part of this panel. I'm not. Man I'm not. Uh, I don't intend to actually really uh, managing or uh, moderating it uh, very much. I'm just uh, uh, want to uh, let's say. Um, uh, collect the discussion and uh, make, make sure that the questions are asked uh, so and uh, and so on and so forth so uh, let me also i mean let's stop, let me stop sharing for a second uh, let me uh, introduce the panelists first so uh, mm, i'm i'm doing this through my uh, uh, let's say the, the the pictures that i'm seeing otherwise uh, it will be too hard uh, so i'm starting from uh, timo bertold uh, that is uh, uh, for me on the upper uh, side, but uh, I mean, of course, it doesn't mean anything. So uh, Timo is, uh, uh, let's say, an expert uh, in mixed integer linear and nonlinear optimization. Uh, and uh, we tried to actually have uh, a, a panel uh, that is covering, uh, of course, the, the, the two parts here. So uh, discrete optimization, uh, combinatorial optimization, as Kate was uh, uh, describing it before. And then, uh, of course, machine learning and try to see that uh, that uh, because, of, of course, that's the topic of <laughs> what we have been doing today. So, Timo, I would say that has been uh, uh, like many of us in discrete optimization. First of all, my name is Andrea Lodi, of course, sorry. And uh, I'm, uh, I've been uh, uh, working on this uh, uh, area of intersection between mas machine learning and discrete optimization, and especially machine learning for discrete optimization for quite a long time with my group in Montreal. Uh, and uh, uh, Timo is definitely also uh, active uh, recently in this area. And, uh, but it's, uh, I would say that yeah, I'm defining it more an expert in machine learning in uh, discrete optimization. So then I have, uh, uh, again, following my uh, link here, I have uh, uh, Frank uh, Hatter. The, Frank is uh, uh, definitely an AI person at large, I would say, and, uh, but the machine learning is very knowledgeable and discrete optimization very knowledgeable. Uh, Kevin Leto Brown, uh, of course, uh, welcome. And uh, same thing for, uh, for him. And uh, uh, I have Kate uh, back uh, that she already introduced herself uh, as <laughs> discrete optimization person, but very knowledgeable in all this field. And uh, Vin uh, Vinod Nair is uh, uh, the, my, the last one in my personal uh, uh, order, but uh, definitely not in the order for the discussion starting here. And uh, the last few words that I'm saying before putting this, a few questions that are, uh, or a few uh, starting points for discussion that I, I uh, already uh, uh, put before, uh, is uh, to say that the, the panel is completely open. So I'm expecting uh, Miles, uh, Maxime, Elias, everybody else, uh, to actually not only ask questions, but actually give us uh, 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 your opinion. And uh, we definitely uh, try to make it uh, as a general uh, uh, discussion around, uh, around this. So uh, coming back to my uh, few starting points that uh, I wanted to, uh, to talk about and uh, to ask your opinion is the, maybe the first one is, uh, is the most important, which is uh, uh, in a certain sense, I think that over the last uh, few years, uh, uh, five to ten, maybe the, this area of machine learning uh, for combinatorial optimization has been growing. Uh, there is uh, interest uh, uh, growing, and maybe one question, very general at this point, is where we feel that uh, the field is going or uh, is uh, heading up. And uh, and uh, I'll uh, I'll just open the floor to your your personal opinions. Maybe this one is related actually to the last question, which is a bit controversial. Um, like, can we have the next breakthrough using machine learning for combinatorial optimization? Can we expect that? 
uh, in terms of like something really new that would change uh, some problems from being solvable to from being unsolvable to solvable, can we expect this kind of breakthrough? Or <clears throat> is machine learning for combinatorial optimization only about uh, what I described in um, in my talk and what the competition was about, which was basically uh, only improving some specific parts of solvers and making solvers faster, like 20%, 50% faster. So can we only expect incremental changes? Or, or do you believe we can expect like a breakthrough in, 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 some, uh, in some areas using machine learning? I think the, the premise of the question is maybe a, a little bit flawed to, to say that there's some kind of dichotomy between being incremental and having a breakthrough. I think um, you, you could, you know, in most areas of machine learning, we see kind of steady advances over a long period of time, and that kind of adds up to a breakthrough. So I, I'm not sure that uh, making making progress incrementally, if we can do it in a sustainable way, is, uh, is such a terrible thing. Um, but uh, I do think that machine learning for combinatorial optimization can be a really big deal. And I guess the reason why I think that is that I think we've been doing um, learning models from data uh, in the sort of heuristic algorithms world um, since the beginning. I think fundamentally, um, you know, we're living at this sort of weird intersection of, uh, of practice and complexity theory where we, we have every reason to believe that the problems that we're trying to solve are hard in the worst case and we nevertheless are able to achieve steadily better performance in replicable ways um, through insights that, that lack um, firm worst case foundations. And so uh, really, I think what we're doing is, uh, is understanding the data that we face, understanding the kinds of structure that tend to arise in the problems that we face um, in, in ways that we can, we can exploit. And I think that's that's fundamentally a machine learning problem. I think you know our field has been really solving machine learning problems by hand, uh, of you know trying to find models that uh, that perform well on the data that we have, and I think there's no other area of machine learning where building machine learning models from hand, by hand has been sustainably a good idea. So I think we ought to expect that we can uh, we can find techniques from machine learning to to you know, offload this task that can, humans really aren't very good at of, uh, of building models in high dimensional data spaces to improve performance. And I think the reason why we're slow in this field to, to get to that point is that our problem is so hard that every labeled observation is a potentially exponential time cost to obtain. Uh, the instance distribution space itself is exponentially big, and it's not always easy to generate large enough amounts of data to get statistical uh, rigor. Um, so, so I think our, our space is really tough, and I think we th we need things like this competition to get to the point where where we can um, we can have replicable benchmarks and have something scalable. But I think I think there's every reason to believe that uh, that there are big gains ahead. I'll leave it there. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah, I uh, agree with Kevin here that uh, I think it's not uh, not necessarily a doom here, but you might uh, see this as a blessing uh, as well, that we are now more and more understanding with, uh, which are the, the good parts where we can make use of uh, uh, machine learning insight optimization. And now that we've seen, I guess that... Uh, machine learning in many cases cannot simply replace an optimization algorithm that might have been the expectation at, uh, at some point when the hype was at its peaks. But uh, we now understand much better, I believe, how we can integrate these two uh, uh, techniques into each other and use machine learning inside solvers. And I find this, this really, yeah, much more interesting than just seeing those as rather uh, competing technologies. Well, I mean, this is a, a clearly controversial, right? I mean, maybe one question is, uh, is that we believe, I mean, uh, Kate, the uh, initial part of the talk, she, she was also talking about directly doing this end-to-end -end learning and the possibility of really solving a problem directly through machine learning. So discrete optimization problem directly through machine learning. So, I, I, of course, this is a... I mean, I'm, I'm personally, I can say my opinion directly. So I see more interesting the part of more potential, the part that uh, that uh, um, Kevin was talking about and also Timo now, so the integration of the two. But uh, but uh, honestly, I'm, 
I'm super happy to get the opinion of everyone over this. Uh, Kate. Uh, yeah, I mean, the, the word breakthrough is interesting. We, we saw this week um, in Science or Nature or somewhere, I can't remember where, um, a breakthrough being declared in pure mathematics where machine learning had been used to, um, not just for theorem proving, but developing new conjectures. And the pure mathematicians are getting super excited right now about the role of machine learning in pure mathematics in a way that they never have before. And I think, um, yes, we can use machine learning to make things slightly faster or replace certain things. But I think the real power is with using machine learning for us, us as researchers gaining more insights into our algorithms and the special conditions under which they fail or succeed and what inspiration that will give us to devise new algorithms. Um, you know, that's how I would interpret a breakthrough. It's not just machine learning automatically doing something, but it's machine learning giving us information that helps us develop a breakthrough, uh, just like the pure mathematicians are finding at the moment. Hmm. Frank? Um, yeah, I'd like to get back to something that Kevin said. Um, um, so, so in terms of, well, machine learning has had a lot of breakthroughs, right? But th this is really just about learning and it's not about decision problems. And, and well, at, at some point, um, I think when we're doing really well in terms of learning something, but well, we want to use this information somehow in order to make decisions. And so ultimately, I, I do believe that, well, all the machine learners out there at some point will figure out that, well, we, we need to now actually solve problems and we need to go to decision problems and we need to then um, worry about constraints and so on. So the, the importance of decision problems will rise. And of course, um, yeah, as Kevin um, said, it, it's not sustainable to build methods from scratch um, and manually and over and over in machine learning, we've seen that well, manually designed approaches get replaced by algorithmically designed and data-driven designed approaches. And that is precisely where machine learning for combinatorial optimization has its role. And so I do expect that we, we will see some breakthroughs, but uh, we need to engineer the path towards there. And um, so this, this partly relates to um, part on um, question two here, how to attract more machine learning people to the field. I, I think one reason probably that we haven't been that fast as in, in standard machine learning is that the problems are harder. And in order to do really well, you need this background in combinatorial optimization and you need the background in machine learning. And well, I, I was uh, working on the intersection, but then I founded my own group and uh, I, I got a lot of people excited, super excited about machine learning and nobody's so excited about combinatorial optimization. So I actually shifted much more to, well, actually using machine learning in order to improve machine learning because that, that's sort of um, where my, my workforce is headed. And um, at some point, I, I think um, we, we can turn this around and it, it with competitions like this, Actually, this is now in Europe, so people care about winning a competition at Europe. So, so I think this is a very good direction. Um, one reason actually that my group didn't participate in here was that we didn't have a um, combinatorial optimization expert on board. And so one way to actually modify a competition like this would be actually to have break the competition into, well, here's a solver, optimize it don't optimize its 2,000 parameters and you don't know which parameters are important, but maybe well, you can work on just the optimization angle or you can optimize them, uh, you can work on just the, um, the MIP side of things. Um, for example, we organized in the past this um, configurable set solver challenge where um, competitors would submit set solvers that have parameters and we would tell them we, we run as competition organizers several state-of-the-art algorithm configuration solvers for a couple of days on an instance distribution. And we pick, um, and the algorithm that wins is the one that after configuration actually does best. Um, what, it's not important how much you improve by configuration, but just if, if configuration is part of the protocol, um, which algorithm is actually best? And, and it could be an algorithm that doesn't have any parameters, or it could be an algorithm that has thousands of parameters. It just, working together with the current tools 
that would be rewarded. And at the same time, you can have a competition that actually rewards the better algorithm configuration methods that work well on current um, MIP solvers. So I think that that could be a way to actually make it easier for machine learning experts to focus on just one thing without needing the background in the combinatorial optimization part. And once they get into the competition, then they'll probably also get excited about the combinatorial optimization and uh, they could bridge the field a little bit. Uh, before uh, giving the uh, the field to Vinod, uh, I was uh, I was about to ask him actually to his opinion on this. So can, uh, uh, to uh, to see if I understood correctly, Frank, you you saying that for example the the task number two would have been uh, 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 in uh, in the in this competition would have been interesting to just limit it to let's try to find the best. So even limiting even the scope. So let's say. You fix uh, everything, but you just ask for the best method for do the learning over this particular set of data, something like this, in order to make even more clear for machine learning people the, the boundary of this, right? That's what you're saying. Um, yeah, yeah, fully. And, and also, I mean, we would have had to figure out what are the best instance features to use, what are the best, um, and, th and for that, you need uh, combinatorial optimization knowledge. And for example, you, you could just make available a gym environment. Um, and there you have all the information you can, and then RL experts can actually um, go into this and, for example, um, decide which are the, the best um, parameters to play in a different state and so on. Mm. Interesting. Vino, please. Yeah, I agree with Frank that uh, the kind of competition uh, that's organized in this workshop uh, would be great for attracting more machine learning people. Um, one thing I've been wondering is whether mixed integer program programming problems are sort of the right domain for applying machine learning because they're you know the classical solvers are extremely mature they're they're very powerful it's not clear there's like a huge room for improvement by applying machine learning um whereas if we pick a domain where you know the problems are not as structured right like you don't have linearity in the objective and, and the constraints um then hopefully machine learning can make a much bigger difference. Um, so maybe there are sort of other domains where uh, machine learning can shine uh, a lot brighter. That could be more attractive for the machine learning audience. Uh, yes, I think it, this is a good point. Uh, well, the, the thing is, if I can uh, say something uh, about this, probably the point is uh, um, at least is a, a mixed integer uh, linear optimization, or even uh, let's say probably let's say mixed integer quadratic as well. So those those things that the solvers can actually do is uh, relatively well. It's at least a let's say a, a, a sort of a grid. Uh, uh, sandbox, right? I mean, if you go really on uh, on uh, more uh, complicated type of problems, um, the situation becomes that uh, you end up having, a, I mean, giving up completely maybe the mathematical part of it in the sense that it would be hard to represent it for a in a standard way, many of those things. So this is actually probably one, my at least my interpretation of the situation. But uh, I mean, of course, it's a, it's a good point. Kevin. Thanks. I guess I wanted to uh, react to the original prompt, if I could, about uh, where the field is headed. I guess we sort of got onto the next breakthrough point. Is that is that appropriate now, or should we? It's okay. Yeah, it's actually completely open. <laughs> I don't really mind. <laughs> <laughs> okay, cool. Uh, so, so as I guess I just made some notes. So let me just make some quick remarks. I think um, I, I guess I, I see kind of five directions that I've heard people talking about today. That I, I wanted to say something brief about each. Um, Configuration, I think, I think is still a really exciting problem that I think a lot more can be done. Um, I think there's, uh, I think it's a really exciting problem because it, it combines active learning and machine learning experiment design uh, in, in a really, um, really intriguing way, particularly with a runtime objective. I think it, it gives rise to this uh, really interesting capping problem that I think in the past few years, we've started to see some really pretty theory about um, that I think is the theorists are starting to um, to br bring some really exciting ideas from learning theory. Uh, I think on the more practical side, I, I think we 
we could really do a lot more to make good use of parallel resources and configuration methods. I think that's, you know, we're just not doing the right things there. And there's always room for more sophisticated ML. And I think in response to what Veena just said, uh, I, I disagree respectfully. I think that there's a lot of performance gains to be had on, uh, on well-defined uh, sub problems. I think, you know, one, I think we have a lot of the right building blocks in place, but I think putting them together in the right way is a really challenging design problem. Um, I think we, we need perpetually to do a lot more around benchmarks. And I wanted to reflect back on something Frank just said about uh, decision problems becoming more important. I guess I have a kind of pet theory that um, one reason why people study um, prediction problems more than decision problems is that we just don't have a lot of good raw data about decision problems that people can work with. And you know, we have a lot of kind of raw sensor data that gives us um, you know, sort of nice um, workflows for prediction problems. But I think kind of inevitably as these prediction problems get more and more commoditized, um, we're going to want to make decisions with the results of those predictions. We're going to have the raw materials that we need to use to, to then make these subsequent kind of optimization decision kinds of problems uh, later. And so I think uh, I, I kind of foresee a second stage coming where uh, this kind of optimization problems are going to be more part of the ML pipeline than they are now, and where ML people are going to care more about these problems. Um, let, let me plug a paper that I'm excited about from my group that was just accepted to AAAI on um, wh what happens when you uh, learn a machine learning um, model, uh, sorry, learn um, using machine learning uh, problem instances. Uh, you learn kind of the coefficients of problem instances. Say you want to predict uh, you want to do vehicle routing, you want to predict something like traffic time, uh, traffic um, congestion, and you want to predict demand, and then you want to do kind of vehicle routing on, on this kind of predicted model. Um, we found that uh, if you learn those coefficients, as people typically do, uh, you can get unbounded loss in the, uh, the quality of a subsequent optimization as compared to differentiating through the optimizer and making those predictions end to end. So uh, I, I think this makes a suggestion for um, for a competition that you, it might be really interesting to have some of this more raw pipeline where you're taking the raw inputs that you might ultimately make instances out of and, and kind of integrating that prediction problem with the optimization problem. I think we're gonna see more of this kind of end-to-end -end optimization and prediction. I think there are a variety of reasons why that can be a really powerful thing to do. Um, a third direction that I think is gonna be really important is thinking about different performance metrics. I think we all understand that the choice of performance metric is pretty ad hoc, um, but we don't, we don't really know quite what to do instead. So I think we need stronger theoretical foundations for understanding when we should choose what performance metric and what it's going to mean for us to do what. Uh, this is something my group is currently getting excited about, although I don't have something to announce now. Um, I think that's particularly true when we care about runtime because we all understand that that capping is a, a first order phenomenon you know that you you sometimes have to stop long runs uh, anyone who's run a competition encounters this all the time uh, so if you have uh, some metric that just cares about uh, the, gets dominated by by tail events that take really really long amounts of time that's kind of incompatible with the reality that you're going to cap runs and so finding some way of thinking about how to how to properly score is really, you know, it's important anyway for thinking about these things, but it's even more important when you're going to do some black box thing that's going to optimize that measure. So I think we need to think a lot more carefully about that. And and it, I, I think what what you guys did in the competition with this uh, area under the curve was was quite sophisticated, quite quite pretty for the uh, solution quality setting, but but still kind of runs into this capping problem. You can you can have a threshold, but I think uh, still more is needed. Um, uh, again, speaking to the competition, reinforcement learning, I think, is really the holy grail problem where you would have some kind of online design of, uh, of a solver uh, based on experience and in a sort of fundamental way. Uh, we see from what worked in the competition that the, the techniques are not fully there yet, uh, but I think this is an exciting direction going forward. Uh, I think credit assignment uh, is, is really tricky uh, when running time is an objective because individual evaluations are just so expensive. So I think finding the right simplifications to provide bias and, and give good traction to ML is really important. Ideas like reward prediction, early stopping, I think we're gonna see a lot of progress in this uh, reinforcement learning direction in the decade ahead. Uh, and lastly, I really like uh, the interpretation angle that Kate has been emphasizing. Uh, I think uh, this is something I've, I've cared about, uh, I guess, in our group's work for 
and maybe a couple of decades really trying to say, if I can build a model that tells me something about how uh, an algorithm is performing, how can I distill something from that model to, to really feed back to the people who, who understand solver design, who understand the primitives, and, uh, and can kind of have an open loop with human experts. I think it's really important that we maintain that perspective and innovate there. Thanks. Thanks, Kevin. Uh, I think it, Timo is online for talking. <laughs> Thanks. So uh, Kevin has met, mentioned that point that uh, we are missing data for some of the tasks. And uh, we have also heard this in, uh, in previous comments. So I think this brings us a little bit to that question of what would be the, the image net equivalent for uh, machine learning for combinatorial optimization. And I mean, an obvious candidate here, I guess, is MIPLIP, which uh, contains uh, in its I mean, the, the whole of MIPLIP, if you don't only look at the benchmark set, contains a little more than a thousand instances, which probably every machine learner in the audience here would say that's a tiny, that's a tiny set. And um, when MIPLIP was compiled, uh, these thousand, thousand instances were drawn from uh, some 5,000 submissions, which uh, if I uh, wanted to play David advocate here, you could say this is this, essentially like all the MIPS that we know that someone ever wanted to solve in the academic world, yeah, to exaggerate. So uh, where do we get this, this data from? And uh, where, do we, where do we get uh, what we're missing, I think, is a, a serious mm -hmm. labeling of what are these instances, what do they represent, uh, and uh, how can we make this attractive for some, someone to maintain this data? I think this might be an even more important question here. I mean, for MIPLIP, essentially, you get one paper every seven years for being a MIPLIP maintainer. Um, and that comes with quite a lot of work. What, what I would be curious what... Uh, uh, well, yes, the, yeah. the, 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 just let me say something before I give the, the, the floor to Vinod again. So the thing is, uh, we, uh, as, a, as a team in Montreal, we... I mean, discussed this issue for quite a long time. So, and how to also make uh, the, um, uh, some of these papers uh, reproducible and making sure that the data was actually was there and so on and so forth. So I think that our answer was uh, uh, the creation of a call, right? I mean, that is the, the environment uh, in which uh, uh, the competition was actually uh, thought about. And because more than the, the problems, I think is actually the data associated with the problems. So the possibility of connected data just running uh, uh, your solver. So at the moment is KIP that we are connected with, but it can be actually uh, different and potentially in the future can be more than that. So I think is actually the number of instances is one thing, but definitely the, the, the important part for uh, especially the area of machine learning for combinatorial optimization is more actually the environment in which you collect the data. But of course, a good point, uh, uh, Timo, as usual. Vino, please. I just want to follow up on Kevin's point about reinforcement learning. I agree Like, there's a lot of interesting research to be done on um, how to improve reinforcement learning techniques for combinatorial optimization. And from our experience at DeepMind, what we've seen is that exploration is by far the biggest challenge. You know, sort of naive exploration techniques like epsilon greedy or just sampling the policy and so forth. Um, don't seem to be enough for very large scale optimization problems. Uh, also learning accurate value functions and so forth. So I think a lot of new ideas need to be brought in to really uh, make RL shine for combinatorial optimization. But I mean, you know, is it, so, I mean, uh, reinforcement learning has shown uh, uh, this power, it, it, its power for, uh, um, I mean, Go and uh, all the subsequent kind of things. So now, is it, I mean, at, the, at some point you were talking about the difficulty of uh, uh, mixed integer linear programming, right? But, but shouldn't be like the end goal. So I think that if you think about branching, right, I mean, the point is that this is the first, the, every time that a combinatorial optimization person talks to or speaks to a, 
a machine learning person and uh, talks about branching, then of course uh, immediately you say, oh yeah, it's machine, le- it's a reinforcement learning type of problem should be attacked in that way. But the point is that instead of 40 moves to win the game, you need uh, maybe 40,000 or 40 exactly. million yeah. nodes. So now <laughs> the question is, uh, I mean, all the sparsity of the of the reward and so on and so forth isn't really like the end goal so in a certain sense can you say that if you can solve this you can uh, really say that there's going to be a breakthrough for machine learning and not maybe for i don't know about computer optimization but it's going to be really like moving uh, uh, lifting the reinforcement learning to a different level potentially yeah Uh, especially like how do you handle extremely large action spaces and also like how do you explore more using semantic abstractions, right? Like rather than, you know, something naive, like naive epsilon greedy, right? Uh, so ideas that are developed for combinatorial optimization could feed into the broader uh, RL literature and, and make a huge difference. Thank you. Uh, Frank? I think at the same time, this, this can also be a um, a, a challenge for RL, but also an opportunity for RL to shine because, well, um, RL has, of course, had awesome successes in, well, these, these more game environments, but what is the commercial value of RL? There is really not that many real life applications yet of RL compared to just standard supervised learning or self supervised learning and so on. And Actually, well, for example, just controlling the hyperparameters of or the parameters of a MIP solver, of a SAT solver, of, of any combinatorial optimization solver, that is a, a very real and very concrete and um, nice and easy to benchmark thing. You can generate your own data. It, it's really a, um, a, a great type of benchmark that we can have for RL. And so we've been, um, in my group, we've been championing this um, direction of dynamic algorithm configuration. So during my PhD back then, I, of of course, worked uh, on algorithm configuration with Kevin and Holger, and then algorithm selection that picks the right algorithm on an instance, um, on the instance at hand. But but really, the the generalization of that is, given the current state of my MIP solver, I'm somewhere down in my branching tree, I have some sort of history, what should I do right now? And what I should do right now actually might differ from what I should do the next step or a thousand steps from now. And, and so you have this classic RL problem of, you know, of, um, yeah, um, the blame attribution, et cetera. And it's, it's really, you need all the stuff from RL. And, um, and there is a lot of challenges. Um, yeah, we not mentioned the, the action spaces. There is a sparsity, but... Um, well, you don't need to necessarily need to make a decision or need to change your decision every step. You can also say, well, I'm going to use the same decision for the next 20 steps or 100 steps or so. Um, we have this paper on Tempo RL, for example, that um, chooses actively to play the same decision for a while in order to um, learn faster. And with that, um, well, I, I think the opportunities are just so large. Just with simple algorithm configuration, we um, back in 2011, we could get 50-fold speedups over CPLEX defaults. And then that was um, even in an instance unspecific manner. And now if you um, if you do this in an instance-specific manner, and then you even do it in a context-specific manner, you could do so much more. And well, I think we shouldn't say, oh, well, but we need to do 50,000 decisions. Well, in algorithm configuration, we do a single decision and we could just say, well, let's do two decisions. Let's choose one parameter setting. And after, I don't know, a minute, we choose a different one. And and so that's a simpler problem than picking 50,000. And and then we can gradually say, well, let's make your decision every 30 seconds, every one second and so on. And then it gradually moves into an RL setting. And I I think we can actually, there's a lot to be gained. Um, Also to echo another point that Kevin said earlier. So I, I see some questions. Thank you, Frank. I see some questions uh, from the, I mean, not exactly the audience, Maxim and Alex, but okay, okay, you guys can go. <laughs> Clear. No, I was actually raising hand for, for the question in the chat. Ah, okay. 
So maybe I can I can just read it. Uh, so Chris Parsonson asks, uh, what is uh, what is it about ML4CO that makes exploration so difficult? What kind of exploration methods do you think seem promising? Uh, maybe that's a question for Binat. Yeah, right. Uh, so, you know, not surprisingly at DeepMind, we've been trying uh, RL on large scale MIPS. And what we have noticed is that um, just sort of the simple off the shelf exploration techniques like Epsilon Greedy um, don't end up producing trajectories that have uh, better rewards. Um, so I suspect what's actually needed is to uh, propose changes to the policy that has some uh, awareness of the semantic structure of the problem, right? And, and not just sort of randomly uh, modify the policy. Um, we haven't made much progress in that direction, but like, we definitely see that um, for like at least the large scale instances, just random exploration isn't helping yet. But this will call for uh, then. Then your uh, your feeling is that this is calling for uh, uh, an even more tight uh, uh, understanding of the MIP uh, itself. So the yeah. yes. so you you can you can't really do uh, random in order to actually learn. That's what exactly. you're saying, right? Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. Alex. Um, so uh, yeah. By the way, great panel discussion. I, I love this. I, I kind of want to go back to something Timo was saying about MIPLIB, um, and the way I think about ML, like a what would I envision as a future in ten years, uh, ML-based combinatorial optimization IP solver, something uh, that has ML at uh, every single component or as many components as possible. I guess I keep thinking about. It could be algorithm configuration where you run it um, and you have this nice set of parameters that takes something like MIPLA, which is a very diverse set of instances and is able to produce something that works well on average on this set of instances. But I, I think one of the advantages maybe for ML is uh, that it is much more tailored to a specific class of instances where you can have a certain company or something else that brings you or like energy that like you have the same unit commitment problem that's being solved day in and day out with minor variations. And what you need is an algorithm that works well for that, but you would really like that done automatically. So this automatic tuning that everybody has been doing here um, is something that we would really like to have like done really, really well. But I think basically it wouldn't be MIPLIB that in my opinion would be the right data set. It would be something what like Kate is developing in a, um, I think that it would be something where we would be able to generate instance, instances with certain properties that we like, that we can then look at those instances and be like, okay, these are similar to a specific part of the uh, company that we're working with. And we tailor it to that and then we run it. And that's what I envision in like 10 years. Like we have ML in a bunch of different components um, and we're able to have instances that are also automatically generated based on the sample. And I don't know, I mean, I guess that's where I see the big progress in incorporating all these ML components into the current type of solving that we think. And it's not so much as like, oh, we want this black box solver that somebody without any work is going to uh, run this solver and get good results, which Agrobi, Cplex, Express, all of those already are doing really well right now. And I think it's very hard for ML to like do that off the bat, but rather on these large sequential similar instance type of families of classes. Um, so I, I guess this is more of a comment than a question, but continuing the discussion in the same direction. So I'm, I'm curious actually, uh, good point, Alex. So I'm curious about, uh, that goes back to my question that uh, I had with, uh, for Kate before uh, her computer <laughs> ran out of battery. So the, the question is, so you're saying that the, the what you're doing, uh, I mean, the, the next uh, in line of the applications that you want to try uh, for uh, Matilda, right? Matilda, yes, uh, is uh, mixed integer programming. So what, what are you guys doing there exactly? So you're comparing for it, because I, I imagine that you, for example, I don't know if it is actually, it would be interesting to compare solvers, but maybe it would be interesting to compare configurations, but I mean, big differences in configurations of, of the same solver. Yeah, it, it's been a dream for a long time to, um, 
to do an instance space of MIPLIB and to propose new instances that MIPLIB would find valuable. Um, and I think online we have Simon. Simon was my student um, and that was his PhD topic, but he, his research took an interesting direction and, we, and we, we focused on that instead. Um, and so we never actually um, achieved that. But, but I always wanted to have an instance space that showed the footprints of CPLEX, Garobi, Express, et cetera. I realise that would be controversial. Um, but, uh, you know, I think there's, there's enormous potential to, to do that kind of thing. Um, but, but thinking also about Alexander's point, that it's really, I think, a really important direction is in practical settings, um, if you want to help a company make decisions, uh, they often don't have enough data that's like theirs. There's no point using machine learning models that are trained on such a broad um, array of problems that really don't have a lot of relevance to them. And often those real world problems are far and few between, and yet they want to have confidence. And so the ability to generate new instances in the region of interest for them, I, I think is a really powerful thing. It's actually very hard. If I said to you, give me a graph that's got a density of 0.6, you could, everyone can easily do that. But if I say, give me a graph that's got an algebraic connectivity of minus 2.3, no one knows how to do that apart from ridiculous trial and error. But we can get machine learning um, to help us, or, or evolution of computation at least, to help us create instances that have target properties. And then you can start to, to customise things much more. Sorry, that was a little bit, I, I tried to answer two questions at, at the same time. Um, nice. but, but Andrea, yes, we, we would love to have an instance space for MIPLIP. The big challenge we encountered was what are the features? And so, yes, you know, AX less than or equal to B, there's lots of stuff we can measure about A and B and, 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 and the feasibility set. Um, but we found some other interesting opportunities like symmetry, you know, some of the really fascinating work of um, Margot, uh, Francois Margot and people like that on symmetry and orbits. Um, we just didn't progress it that far. But there's a lot of stuff we can measure about a MIP that would give useful features that might affect the performance of solvers or, or branching strategies and other things. Um, but, yeah, this is it's still an open question. Yeah, interesting. So uh, I don't know uh, if... Uh, I mean, of course, some of these questions uh, remain unanswered, but uh, <laughs> I think it's food for thoughts for everyone in the audience uh, and in the panel as well. So uh, I, I really hope that um, it was, I mean, it's coming to the, the official end of this discussion. I think it's five, more or less. I mean, five in uh, some... Uh, uh, part of the world, I guess, because <laughs> I, I, I'm not uh, pretending to be actually exhaustive. And uh, the, the thing is, uh, um, I mean, I, we really hope uh, as a, a co-organizer that this competition was actually uh, useful in a certain sense for bridging uh, even more the communities and making sure that uh, things were actually uh, um, known uh, in uh, in various uh, areas. I think it uh, the, the the group did um, did a great job uh, in uh, in setting up this. Uh, and uh, I would like to thank especially Maxime for uh, leading the group uh, into this direction. And uh, but I mean, of course, everybody else that is uh, sitting here uh, is still actually there. My, uh, Elias, of course. Uh, I mean, I would forget people, so I, I'm, I'm, I'm thanking Maxim as uh, uh, the leader of of the comp of the competition organization and and such. So thank you again, Maxim, for uh, leading all of us. Thank you so much, Andrea. And uh, uh, I, I just I, I think... just send a message. Uh, Maxime, before you leave, um, yes. all, comp all competition organizers, could you leave the competition online for additional submissions? Because that might directly lead to more people entering. Yeah, yes. So I am, uh, I am thinking about that. It's a bit tricky because you have to pay for the compute resources somehow. Uh, but it's something that's, that someone has mentioned already and we, we are thinking about it. Uh, so let's... Uh, well, we have to find a solution for yeah, me, yeah. for, for Ettri. I mean, yeah. I, we are definitely uh, uh, completely in uh, in the spirit of doing that, except that we don't know <laughs> from the practical standpoint how to make it happen. <laughs> but other than that, yes. So yeah. it's uh, it's a good uh, suggestion, Frank. And uh, indeed, uh, I think Maxim was touching it before uh, as well. So the, the, infra the infrastructure that uh, the, our sponsors allowed us to have, uh, especially Compute Canada, 
has some expiration time. So we will see if uh, we can extend it at least a little bit. Uh, I'm sorry. Yeah, for example, I would love, love to make it a, a student um, class project in, in my next AutoML course. I think then I'm immediately like, yeah, 50 students would try to apply machine learning on this. And, and I'm probably not the only one for whom that could be really nice. And, and that is often not possible within a couple of months of a competition. Yeah, absolutely. True. Maxime, do you want to say something for the very end? Yeah, so yeah, I was just trying to uh, handle the situation in parallel. Uh, my sick, is, uh, my child is sick. I, I just had a call from the man, so I have to leave like immediately. It's very <laughs> this timely. is the most important part. <laughs> yeah, it's very timely. So just go. Don't worry. Yes, then, so I, I let then you handle we... things. So goodbye. Bye. So uh, yeah, I think this uh, uh, we 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 end from a, on a personal note. And uh, it's uh, thank you very much for uh, all, all of you uh, for the I mean the, the, the actually the colleagues and friends in the panel and uh, and the fact that uh, somebody was serving in the chat that everybody stayed until the very end so this is a, this shows that there is a, a, a let's say a lot of interest but also uh, I mean the the fact that uh, the 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 organizers again so Maxim and everybody else did a great job. I'm, uh, and uh, and so thank you very much to all of you 